That's the sound of a future children's campus being built. That's the sound of a new heart beating in an eight-year-old. That's a game of pickup basketball being won on wheels. And that is the sound of joy when a teen is cured of cancer. This is what it sounds like when you donate to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Give today at choa.org slash donate because nothing matters more than kids. Deep underground the Jelly Belly factory, BB is in her secret laboratory creating the weird and wild flavors of Bean Boozled. I thought it again. Is it pomegranate or old bandage? <laughs> Dare to compare. <laughs> Bean Boozled, 6th edition. Are you brave enough? Sure. There you go. Mm-hmm. 
You got a missing broadcast on the boy, Harry? Yeah, Doherty did about half an hour ago. Here's a description right here. Thanks. Mother know about the bloodstains? No, we didn't tell her. She's worried enough already. She has no idea what might have happened to her boy, huh? Mm, no more than we do. Checked all the friends, relatives. We're covering the neighborhood. No trace so far. Not much to go on. Bloodstains, empty cartridge. It could mean a hundred things. Any ideas, Freddy? Just one, and I don't like it. p.m. Thursday, December 22nd. The neighborhood search for nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone continued. Ray Pinker went back to the crime lab to start the precipitant test and the blood grouping. Levinson and his partner, Doherty, from Highland Juvenile, stood by. We called Chief of Detective Thad Brown, and he ordered up a special detail to aid in the search for the missing boy. Frank and I questioned the boy's mother, Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early 40s. She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Mr. Johnstone, is your boy Stanley in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. When was the last time, Miss Johnstone? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, ma'am. Well, there comes that time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home. Go out on his own. It usually happens somewhere around 8 to 10. Yes, ma'am, I think I know what you mean. I'm a boy. Well, then you know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one afternoon after school, and he was quite put out about it. But George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. Well, how long was he gone, ma'am? Oh, no time at all, about two hours. I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone. Said every boy had to go through that stage. Uh-huh. Well, then you think he's gone away from home again this time, do you? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now. And, you know, I have a funny feeling about it. Did you and his father happen to have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? Well, that's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you now that we're talking about it. I'm getting worried. Any place around that you might like to visit? A hobby shop or a playground? Something like that where you might be? Yes, there's Jensen's model shop, Little Helen Woods. But I've already called there and he hasn't been seen all day. I've called all of his friends and they have no idea either. Mm-hmm. We'd like a list of all of his friends and the places that he was known to frequent, ma'am. That's all right. I'll give them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where's your husband now, Mrs. Johnstone? At work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. Uh Uh-huh. What house is he stationed at? Engine Company 12. He's working the A platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him that Stanley's gone. Was there any chance that the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No. He seldom goes down there anymore. No, I don't think he's there. I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Well, certainly. You go right ahead. I know George will be worried. Stanley's been gone too long. Well, hello. May I speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. I hate to call George at his work. Yes, sir. Does your husband know the gun, ma'am? Yes, he does. What caliber would you know? It's a forty-five automatic. He's got it, me. George? Well, this is Ruth. George, is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh, no, I can't find him anywhere. He wasn't here when I came home from doing my shopping. There are two policemen here. No, I said there are two policemen here. No, dear, I'll call you if we don't find him soon. Oh, all right. Yes, you too. Bye. I didn't think he'd be with George. Oh, that forty-five. is that the only gun in the household? Yes. Why are you asking about guns? Has anything happened that you're not telling me about? No, ma'am, just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that forty-five, if you don't mind. Maybe I should tell you we do have another gun in the house, but it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. Well, if we can look at it, please. Yes, will you have to unwrap it? I'm afraid so. Well, that's the forty-five. Yes, that's it. Let me see. Well, here's the paper it was wrapped in. Stanley left the farm, but it's gone. You see? Here's the gift card in the box the gun came in. The rifle. Uh-huh. Could I look at the box, ma'am? Thank you. How about it, Joe? Twenty-two caliber. Thursday, December 22nd, 5.15 p.m. It was getting dark. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Levinson again. He'd been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood, but they'd found nothing. We went down to Hollis Avenue and 10th Street, service station on the corner. You want a dime, Joe? No, I got one. You watch the chief brown, huh? Yeah. Yeah.
second. Still no sign of either of the missing boys. Chief of Detective Thad Brown went back to headquarters to direct the search from there. He dispatched another detail of 50 men to aid in the hunt for the missing youngsters. 8.30 p.m. It was getting colder. The citrus growers were warned to expect a freeze. We went back up the block to see Mrs. Johnstone. Her husband had quit work early and returned home. We talked with him. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. We still had not informed either of the families about the blood stains and the empty cartridge casing which had been discovered in the backyard of the Johnstone home. It was more than possible that they had a right to know about our findings, but Frank and I felt there was no cause to add to their distress at this particular time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the blood stains and the cartridge would be of no concern to the relieved parents. At 8.40 p.m., Frank and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Martin. Mrs. Martin, you said your husband worked at the market. Yes. He telephoned about 15 minutes ago and said he was closing up right away. He'd be here any minute. I do wish Stevie would call or come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton jacket. Well, try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. He'll be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. And the boy is so close. I know he's terribly upset. Yes, ma'am. Are you sure there's no place you might have forgotten? Some place where the boy might be? No. No place. No. If anything's happened to the boy, it'll just kill John. Mrs. Martin. Uh, you sit still. I'll get it. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, Harry. John's don't care. He's been found. <laughs> Sergeant, he's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No. No, he didn't. His clothes are all dirty and he's acting strange. I've, I've never seen anyone like this. How do you mean, Mrs. Johnston? Well, he just came in the front door and said, Hello, Mom, and then he sat down in a chair and stared at the floor. He talked to his father and me. Do you mind if I talk to him? No, go ahead. I asked him about the little Martin boy. He wouldn't tell me a thing. Well, where is he now? Right over there in the living room. Oh, yeah. Looks all right. Yes. Son. Son, this is a police officer. He wants to talk to you. Don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Stanley? Come on, boy, look at me. Come on, youngster, get your head up. No, that's better. You had your mother pretty worried, you know that? You want to tell us where you've been? I wish you'd try to get him to eat a little something. You hear that, son? You want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the street who hasn't come home. Do you know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too, just like your folks were. you got to help us find him, son. I killed him. I killed Steve with the 22. Went on and him, but I killed him. Well, how do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt now, isn't he? No. He's dead. I'm really dead. The gun went off. We forgot we put bullets in there. Well, where is he, Stanley? I hit him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. Where did you hide him, son? In a cave up on the hill. I didn't mean it. He was my pal. Do you want to show us where, Stanley? Yes, sir. I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone led the way up the hill behind the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he'd moved the body in. His father came along with us. About 50 feet from the crest of the hill, the boy pointed to a thicket of scrub oak. There we found a small cave holding the body of Stephen Martin. There was a single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. We covered the body. Stanley, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. I knew my folks were going to give me a bullet for Christmas. I knew where it was, and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing a gun at Stephen's son? No, sir. No, no, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him. He tripped over that stump and he fell. The gun hit him in the stomach and went off. Well, why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth here? I'm telling the truth. Honest, it's the truth. All right, I believe you, son. Why do you think you killed him? My gun. 
He'd give me life for him to get it. I should have waited for Christmas. It's all my fault. Where have you been all this time? In the cave. With Steve. What were you doing in there, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make him alive again. <laughs> After a thorough investigation, Frank and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Martin was accidental. Ray Pinker's findings substantiated the Johnstone Boys' story, even to the smallest detail. We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Martin home. Mrs. Martin collapsed. The family doctor was called. Frank and I sat in the living room to wait for John Martin, the dead boy's father. Edith? Edith? Mr. Martin? Yes. You the police? Yes, sir. Where's Edith? Where's my wife? Has my boy come home? Well, have you found him? Yes, sir. Where is he? Steve? Stevie? Where's Steve? Hurt, isn't he? Yes, sir. Where is he? I want to see him. He's hurt pretty bad. Come on. Oh, where is he? I want to see him. How bad? Pretty bad. I know it 
wasn't your fault, Stanley. I, w- I wonder if you'd do something for me. Yes, sir. I've got a lot of nice presents for Stevie. I know he'd want you to have them. I want to give them to you. Christmas Eve. Mom? I think that'd be a fine idea, son. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Well, what's it all prove, Joe? You don't give a kid a gun for Christmas. December 24th, the coroner's inquest was held in the county morgue, county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. At the coroner's inquest, it was officially recorded that Stephen Martin's death was the result of an accident. Stanley Johnstone was absolved of any legal responsibility for his friend's death. Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, William Johnstone, Sammy Ogg. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.